Our next uh, presenter on the pharmacokinetic modeling of air lead and blood lead level relationship is Dr. Kathleen Vork. Dr. Vork has extensive experience and expertise relating to the pharmacokinetics of lead in the worker and the general adult population. Her research has used various statistical and mathematical modeling methods to estimate, adjust, and check the accuracy and consistency of biokinetic models. Dr. Vork is currently a research scientist in the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment at the Environmental Protection Agency in California. She received her Ph. Degree, PhD degree in environmental health sciences from the University of California at Berkeley and her MPH degree in occupational and environmental health from the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Her dissertation work had focused on lead exposure during construction work. Please uh, welcome uh, Kathleen. Well, thank you, Dr. Howard, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And thank you very much, um, Dr. Kosnett, for a very compelling uh, story on uh, the science of um, the health effects of lead. And thank you, all of you, for the opportunity to present OEHA's work involving the est uh, in estimating a workplace exposure and worker blood lead concentrations using an updated physiologically based pharmacokinetic or PBBK model. So before I begin, um, I'd like to go over the major topics that I'll be covering. First, I will cover a bit of the background about the project that OEHA was asked to do and um, its purpose. Then I'll explain the modeling task that we were asked to do. And after that, I will give an, uh, uh, an overview of the process involved in selecting, updating, and testing the model. And finally, I will show you some of the results of our modeling work. So we just heard from Dr. Kosnett about the new evidence of the adverse and compelling evidence of the adverse health effects of, of um, blood lead levels that are much lower than the limits set by the current OSHA st standard. In order to, to address this new evidence, the California Department of Public Health, or CDPH, is making recommendations to Cal OSHA to change the current workplace standard for lead to one that is more protective of worker health. As part of that effort, estimates of workplace air concentrations of lead that result in a range of blood lead levels are needed. These estimates were originally established back in the 1970s with the help of a predictive model. So CDPH turned to OEHA to do the bottling work. So the Occupational Lead Poisoning Prevention Program at the Department of Public Health initiated a memorandum of understanding with OEHA to perform two tasks relative to chronic workplace exposure conditions. The first task is to calculate air concentrations of lead that correspond to the blood levels in workers, and the second task is to estimate the time it takes for high blood lead levels to return to a much lower blood lead level after removal from exposure to lead in the workplace. So CDPH needed to characterize the air blood lead relationship over a working lifetime at relatively low blood lead levels. Although there is a growing body of literature showing the air-blood relationship among uh, worker groups. We could not find a study um, of exposures over working lifetime in the open literature. 
So OEHA used a physiologically based pharmacokinetic model to do this characteriz characterization. So um, why do we need a um, PBBK model? Well, there's several complex issues involved in how the body handles lead. Um, there are two absorption pathways with very different characteristics of absorption. And lead distributes all over the body. And the uptake, storage, and release from different tissues varies greatly from weeks to months to decades, as Dr. Kosnett had pointed out. In addition, there are two major elimination pathways. Under these circumstances, a PVBK model is needed to cope with these multiple issues. So before I go on to the modeling work we did, I'm going to take a f just a few minutes to explain what a PVBK model is in general and then give you an example of how a lead model copes and needs to cope with two complex issues. So a physiologically based pharmacological kinetic model is a mathematical model that represents the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of a substance in the human body. Models are made up of multiple compartments that correspond to the organs and tissues in the body with connections between compartments via the blood. Mathematical equations represent the concentration of the substance in the compartment and movement between compartments. The equations are often derived from experimental studies on humans and animals. Some models are quite straightforward. However, in the case of lead, the model needs to be complex. The air and blood lead relationship, for example, changes with exposure history and the buildup of lead in, in blood. So here's a general diagram of a model for lead. In this model, lead enters through two pathways. Once in the blood, much of the lead binds to red blood cells, and some remains unbound in the plasma, free to distribute throughout the body. As the amount of lead in blood increases, several studies show that the red blood cells take up less and less lead. and at very high levels become saturated. As um, red blood cells take up less and less lead, the unbound lead in plasma rises. And that increases the amount of lead that distributes to soft tissue and bone, or eliminates, or that is eliminated through the urine pathway. In, in addition, over time, the amount of lead in bone accumulates, and the amount that releases from bone back to blood um, also increases, as illustrated by the fatter, fatter red arrows pointing back to the blood. These changes in how the body distributes and eliminates this metal has led to a rich accumulation of models. So now I will um, go into the steps involved in the overall project that we um, were asked to do. So here is a flow diagram uh, of the steps involved with um, our overall project. First, we reviewed and selected an existing model. And second, we tested the model. I'm just going to go down the, the flow diagram here. Um, second, we tested the model with worker data. Third, we adjusted the ret and retested the model. Fourth, we added the features to um, adapt the model to workplace exposure scenarios. And fifth, we tested the adapted model and used it to complete the two tasks we were asked to do. So in the next section of this presentation, I will briefly, briefly summarize each step. And finally, I'll show you some results for uh, tasks one and two from the adjusted model we call Leggett Plus.
So we started by reviewing the literature and selected the best pu published model for our purposes. We chose the model design and tested by Dr. Richard Leggett, who um, published his model in 1993. Um, there's a tradition of naming models after the people who designed them. So the one designed and tested by Dr. Leggett is referred to as the Leggett model. Um, and it's referred to oftentimes in the, in the peer-reviewed literature discussing models. Although there are many lead models that have been validated, peer-reviewed, and published, we chose the Leggett model because it handled changes in exposure history and copes with complex issues of red blood cell saturation and the accumulation and release of lead in the skeleton. And um, it has a modular structure. So um, here's a schematic diagram of Dr. Leggett's model showing flows in and out of multiple compartments with blood being the central compartment. So, and here are boxes on the right that represent separate lung separate lung and gastrointestinal tract models illustrating the modular design of this overall model. Leggett refers, offers both a simple and more com complicated lung model in his publication. So the first thing we did was to test predictions of blood lead levels from the core Leggett model with worker data, the core model being what the model does after lead enters the blood. So we searched the literature for individual measurements of blood lead levels over time and settled on the ASARCO data set. This is, a da this is data from a cohort of smelter workers made available in the report to federal OSHA by Dr. Dale Haddis in 1981. This rich data set provided blood lead measurements and employment histories on a large number of workers. Blood lead levels obtained before employment offered an estimate of background non-workplace exposure. Blood lead levels taken after a long history of exposure and just before a labor strike, along with level, levels taking, taken after returning from that nine month strike, offered a way of checking how accurately the model characterizes elimination from lead from the skeleton. We concluded that this cohort provided the best data available to represent workers chronically exposed to lead. I'm smiling at Dr. Haddis sitting in the audience here. <laughs> um, so here, here is a graph that compares measured and predicted blood post-strike blood lead levels. Measured blood lead levels are on the horizontal axis and predicted blood lead levels are on the vertical axis. The line going through the through the data points represent a one-to-one -one relationship or zero difference between the measured and predicted blood lead levels. Now zero difference on average would indicate no systematic bias in predicting post-strike blood lead levels for this worker cohort. But here you can see that most measured blood lead levels are greater than predicted blood lead levels. And in fact, um, the mean difference for the cohort was four micrograms per deciliter, indicating that the mo model systematically underpredicted blood lead levels by that much. We were initially pretty satisfied with that model, um, that the model predicted post-strike blood lead levels close to those measured in the worker cohort. However, some of our external reviewers <laughs> viewed this as unacceptable bias. So the next step was to find and adjust key parameters in the model and retest the adjusted model with the same smelter cohort data. 
Okay, so in our review of studies that examined and um, adjusted the Leggett and other lead models, we found that parameters related to the four um, parts of the model listed here are candidates for adjusting the model and reducing the systematic under prediction of blood levels in the um, ASARCO cohort. Since our adjustments involved multiple parameters relating um, to lead in plasma, urine, and blood, we also needed to check how well predictions of lead in these and other compartments fit measurements of lead in these fluids and body tissues in the body. Hence, in addition to the ASARCO data set, we extracted data from several additional studies of chronically exposed lead workers. To check the effect of model adjustments on predictions of lead in bone, we compared model predictions to measurements of lead um, in bone by X, that was measured by X-ray fluorescence, as mentioned by technique that was mentioned by um, Dr. Kosnett from a group of workers chronically exposed to lead in, the, um, in a Canadian smelter, at a Canadian smelter, and um, bone lead data from autopsy studies of the general population. So to check the effect of model adjustments on predictions of lead in red blood cells, urine, and other body tissues, we compared model predictions to measurements of lead in plasma and urine relative to blood lead taken from chronically exposed workers in these studies listed here, as well as lead in body tissues from autopsy studies in the general population. By satisfying the five tests that are listed here, We were convinced that the, bod that the model could accurately and, re and reliably predict blood lead levels after chronic ex workplace exposure, and along with a, an adapted workplace exposure model, would be able to complete the two tasks specified in the um, MOU. So before I show you the results of the tests we performed, I want to show you uh, the final values of our key parameters of the Leggett model relative to those in the original Leggett model that are shown in the second column and those established through a study um, by Nyan colleagues shown in the fourth column. So um, we ran hundreds of model performance tests before arriving at our final set of parameter values, which fell between those published by the original, um, in the original model by Leggett and later by Nye. In addition, we lowered the red blood cell concentration of lead at which binding capacity saturate, saturates, shown here in this um, second to last row of the table. This value is based on a study of red blood cell saturation in non-human primates published by um, Ellen O'Flaherty. We also removed the assumed threshold established by Leggett um, in his original model. Okay, here is the graph of red blood, uh, of um, blood lead levels among the ASARCO workers measured after returning from a nine month strike versus post strike blood lead levels predicted from the adjusted Leggett model. These data are evenly sc scattered about the one to one relationship. And recall that the original test of measured versus predicted post-strike blood lead levels indicated that the model systematically underpredicted on average blood lead levels by four micrograms per deciliter. Well, this graph shows a much better fit 
and a mean difference between measured and predicted blood lead levels of slightly less than one microgram per deciliter, indicating improved performance from the adjusted model. In addition, we saw no statistically significant evidence as indicated by a p-value greater than um, 0.05 that the model performed differently relative to how long workers were exposed, indicating that uptake and release of lead from bone was about right in the adjusted model. So next, we ran an exposure scenario for one retired smelter worker from the Canadian data set um, published by Nye and colleagues um, to show how the adjusted model predicts lead in two different types of bone and in whole blood over time. In, so in this graph, the purple line represents lead predicted in trabecular bone, and the blue line represents lead predicted in cortical bone. The red line represents lead in whole blood. In the NYE study, lead was measured by X-ray fluorescence technique in bone sites represented, representing each bone type. And The blue stars in this graph represent the average of several measurements taken on one smelter worker four years after retirement. In the um, entire cohort, the range of lead measured in trabecular bone um, in the subjects of the Nye study the ratio between the trabecular and the um, cortical bone uh, fell between, uh, trabecular bone was about two to three times those measured, the uh, lead leveled in, uh, lead level measured in cortical bone on a mass per mass basis, which is similar to what um, is modeled by the adjusted legged model. So uh, next, we needed to check the predictions of lead in other body tissues and fluids from, um, with the predictions from the adjusted model. Um, so here's brief, br some brief summaries of the data that we used to check the adjusted model. Manton, and I'll just briefly mention their characteristics. Manton and Cook reported Lead levels in serum and whole blood obtained from patients of a medical practice. Lee reported summary estimates of lead in urine and whole blood from chronically exposed battery factory workers. And Harada and colleagues reported multiple sets of blood and urine lead taken from four chronically exposed workers from a specialty paint factory in Korea. So this graph shows how lead levels in plasma or serum shown on the vertical axis increase relative to levels of lead in whole blood shown on the horizontal axis. The red squares represent the data from the Harada study. The blue diamonds represent the data from the Manton Cook study. And the teal triangles represent the predicted levels of lead in plasma relative to whole blood from the adjusted Leggett model. Note that the predictions fell within the data from these two studies. OK. Um, so here's. Here, the graph on the left shows how lead levels in urine, again shown in the ver on the vertical axis, increase relative to levels of lead in whole blood, shown on the horizontal axis. Now, the blue squ squares represent the mean in one standard deviation, as reported in the Lee study. On the right, the blue diamonds represent the data from the Harada study whereas the teal triangles represent predicted levels of lead in urine relative to whole blood from the adjusted Leggett model. 
So finally, we examined how well the adjusted Leggett model distrib uh, distributed lead across body tissues by comparing the percent of lead predicted to be in body compartments to lead in tissue groups um, reported in autopsy studies. Dr. Leggett tested the, his original model with autopsy data by combining data from several autopsy studies and deriving uncertainty bounds. We repeated this comparison with, predict with predictions from the adjusted Leggett model. So here are two bar graphs showing estimated lower and upper bound estimates of the proportion of lead body burden that resides in six tissue groups. The bar graph on the left represents estimates from autopsy studies of people in their 20s and 30s, and the bar graph on the right rep represents estimates of autopsy studies of people in their 40s and 50s. Now, the darkest bar in each graph represents predictions from the uh, adjusted Leggett model, and the next two bars to the right of that darker bar represent the lower and upper bound estimates from the Leggett uncertainty analysis of autopsy data. And note that the predictions stayed within the limits of uncertainty. So first of all, the test based on the ASARCO data provided convincing evidence that the adjusted Leggett model accurately and reliably predict the levels of lead in blood after an extended time away from workplace exposure. Also tests based on the, the data from factory workers, smelters, patients, and post-mortem studies provided convincing evidence that the adjusted Leggett model accurately predicted the level of lead in other body tissues. Once we were convinced that these tests, by these tests, that we felt, um, we felt that we could move on to the next step, which was to add exposure features to the model. So now I'm going to describe how we incorporated each of the, ex the workplace exposure factors listed here into the exposure model. So first, we examined the literature on activity-based breathing rates. Two major studies, one reported um, by US EPA in the, in the 2009 um, Exposure Factors Handbook, and the other by the um, International Commission of Radiologic Protection, or ICRP. Uh, which, and the two of them differed somewhat in how they uh, uh, labeled, I guess, uh, the breathing rates associated with certain activities. So for example, breathing rates associated with light activity in the ICRP analysis were similar to those reported for moderate activity in the US EPA exposure factor handbook. However, we selected breathing rates associated with activity levels reported by the US EPA and assumed that more than half of the workers um, in a 24-hour day spent resting or performing light work and less than half performing moderate level activities with a resulting breathing rate of 26 meters cubed per day per workers. Next, we examined how workplace air lead once inhaled transfers to blood. The next several slides address how we determined the best inhalation transfer coefficient values to use. To start with, the amount of lead transferred depends on several factors, including the, the size distribution of lead particles in workplace air, wherein the where in the <coughs> respiratory tract particles deposit, and how they are cleared. <coughs> 
So we extracted information from studies that characterized the, the size distribution of lead particles in several workplaces and operations. We selected three. The Park and Pick reported study reported size distributions of lead particles from several industries listed here. And the Lou study um, reported similar um, operations or uh, industries, but in addition, also reported the size distribution of particles in um, the, a brass foundry. And Spear reported data on uh, four lead compounds. So these um, leads of lead particles. And so these studies provided a broad range of information about um, lead particles in the workplace. So we derived an inhalation transfer coefficient from an analysis of lead deposition in the respiratory tract using a model called the multipath particular dose, uh, part, particle dosimetry, or MPPD, MPPD version 2. This recently developed model predicts the fraction of lead deposited in the, in the head and lung regions based on particle size, breathing rate, and other parameters. Using the output of the model, combined with other generally accepted information about how the respiratory tract handles particulate matter, we, esta um, we established an equation that's highlighted here for the in inhalation transfer coefficient, or ITC, at the bottom of the diagram. This equation says that the transfer of the inhaled lead in, is equal to the percent deposited in the alveolar region of the lung or the deep lung times the percent absorbed by the, to the blood plus the percent deposited in the head or upper airway region of the respiratory tract, which is the ciliated region, region times the percent absorbed to the blood. So here's an example of output from the MPPD2 model showing the range of percent lead deposited in the total respiratory system and broken down by the percent deposited in the ciliated and head region and the alveoli or the deep lung. Particle size information of mostly Small, smaller, I'm sorry, particle size and information and results from the um, deposition analysis for resting and heavy activities appear in column two for radiator repair workers who um, had mostly small particles in the workplace, measured mostly s s smaller particles in the workplace, and column three for battery workers exposed to mostly higher, um, larger particles relative to the radiator workers. And notice that this substantial proportion of inhaled lead from both occupational groups is deposited in the upper airways. Okay, so it's well established that particles that deposit in the deep lung or alveoli <laughs> absorb directly to the blood and those that deposit in the upper airways and head move to the throat and are swallowed to be absorbed through the gut. Since a large proportion of the lead is deposited in the upper airways, we concluded that accounting for this under various conditions in the gut is important because um, that's where it transfers to the blood. For simplicity, we assume that the that the form of lead inhaled is highly soluble and absorbs completely from the alveoli within a day. We calculated that about 30% of the lead that is swallowed absorbs from the gut to the blood within a day. So I'll walk you through the basis of this calculation next. <clears throat> 
another drink of water. <laughs> So Leggett actually summarized the percent absorbed in the gut from several mass balance studies. And so we took the midpoint of the percent of a um, of the mid pent, the midpoint of the percent absorbed, um, which is found here on the slide um, in black type and the range of lead absorbed to the blood under um, three different conditions in the gut are shown in blue type. On the right are the time weightings and midpoints that we used. We had assumed that during most of the day, the gut is empty or contains only liquid. And hence, about 30% of the lead moved from the respiratory system to the gut absorbs to the blood over 24 hours. Then, based on the percent absorbed from the deep lung and um, from the gut to the blood, the fraction of lead deposited in the deep lung in the ciliated and head region of the respiratory tract, we calculated an inhalation transfer coefficient. <clears throat> so, in this, so in the example at the top of the slide, we calculated ITCs based on activity during the, the workday. And in this example, workers inhaled lead particles from battery manufacturing engaged in heavy activity transferred 30% of the lead deposited in the respiratory system. We also calculated um, ITCs based on a time weighting of activity levels during the workday for several occupational settings, which all tended to be around 30%. So we were convinced that 30% of the lead deposited in the respiratory tract transfers to the blood. So a default breathing rate of 26 meters cubed per day, an ITC, inhalation transfer coefficient of 30%, a default fraction of each day that a worker is exposed per over a year, and the measured personal breathing zone concentration of lead makes up the ex, makes up the model adapted to workplace conditions. So the next step involved combining uh, the adapted exposure model with the adjusted core model, now called Leggett Plus, and testing it with data from studies that reported air and blood lead, level, blood lead levels at the individual subject level. So this diagram illustrates the final testing process. We selected two studies that collected both air and blood lead, blood lead information for each study subject. We used the information from these studies as inputs to the model and compared predictions of blood lead from Leggett Plus to blood lead levels observed in study subjects. So the first study conducted by Williams and colleagues in the 1960s um, on air and blood lead, uh, collected air and blood lead data from battery uh, plant workers in order to model worker exposure, however, we had to make some assumptions about exposure from sources of lead other than the workplace and the number of years these workers were exposed to, um, to lead in the workplace. So the data provided by Williams are listed in the first three bullets and the assumptions we applied to the model are listed in the last two bullets. So, Here's a graph comparing measured and predicted blood lead levels. On this graph, values of 16 measured blood lead levels that were at or below 60 micrograms per deciliter are on the horizontal axis, and predicted blood lead levels are on the 
from the Leggett Plus model are on the vertical axis. And so as stated earlier, the line going through the data points represents a one-to-one -one relationship or zero difference between measured and predicted blood lead levels. And you can see that the measured blood lead levels are distributed above and below the line. And on average, Leggett Plus predicted blood lead levels in line with those observed by the Williams et al. study. The second study, published by Griffin and colleagues in 1975, collected air and blood lead levels from volunteers exposed under controlled conditions in a chamber. The two experiments were conducted each over an average of 16 weeks. The data provided by the study are listed here. When we ran, when we ran the Leggett Plus, we adjusted the values in the exposure model, however, to reflect a 23-hour daily exposure over consecutive days rather than the time waiting for uh, an exposure um, in the workplace, which is five days a week and um, eight hours a day. So again, you can see that the Leggett Plus predicts blood levels on average in line with those observed um, from the Griffin study. So after all this testing, adjusting, and retesting, we are convinced that the Leggett model predicts the uptake, distribution, and, elim and elimination of lead after chronic workplace exposure consistently and without significant bias, establishing an air-blood-lead relationship. At this point, we could convincingly complete, confidently complete the two modeling tasks CDPH asked OEHA to do. So first we provided results for the median worker, was by modeling, but then you know, of course, individuals um, differ from one another in the way their bodies handle lead. Therefore, we needed to account for the distribution of values among workers. And this required a description of the inter-individual variability. This type of variability is generally understood to be log-normally distributed and represented by a geometric standard deviation. So we were confident that the work accepted by US EPA and published by a different Griffin and colleagues in 1999 was also suit suitable for our purposes. Griffin and colleagues examined the inter-individual differences in blood lead levels from two large cohorts of children indep independent of levels of exposure to lead in soil. They conducted multiple statistical tests and reported median geometric standard deviations between 1.4 and 1.7. Well, then OEHA estimated the GSD of blood levels from experimental and worker cohorts as well and concluded that the geometric mean chosen, a geometric standard deviation chosen um, by US EPA of 1.6 is representative of the inter-individual inter variability in the worker population as well. From predictions of blood lead levels for the median worker, we estimated blood lead levels associated with workers at the 95th percentile of the inter-individual distribution. So here is part of the final estimates provided by in OEHA's report for task one. The eight hour time weighted average air lead levels are in the first column corresponding and the corresponding blood lead levels appear in the second column. Similarly, we model the time needed to restore blood lead levels 
to 15 micrograms per deciliter given various exposure scenarios for the median worker. And here is part of the final estimates provided in a WEHOS report for the 95th percentile worker. So in this table, time in months appears in the center of the table, in units of months. Blood levels just be before removal are listed in the second column, and the exposure period is listed in the first column. So when a worker who is exposed to the same job, to the same breathing zone lead concentration, reaches a blood lead level of 30 after 40 years and is removed from the workplace <coughs> exposure, Leggett Plus predicts that the 95th percentile worker will take about 15 months to return to a blood lead level of 15 micrograms per deciliter. So this completes the five-step process I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that took us to this point. So I want to say that my take-home message here is that a well-designed model, a synthesis of new information about the body, how the body, body handles lead, and an exposure model adapted to workplace conditions provides, uh, along, with check, uh, along with it being checked by worker and other human data, has provided CDPH with the best information for making their recommendations to Cal OSHA. Um, before I finish, I want to mention some um, precautions. <coughs> Firstly, these testing efforts were limited to data from mostly adult males exposed chronically to lead. Secondly, it has not been tested for its ability to predict blood lead levels over very, very short-term exposures. And um, blood levels higher than, nor blood lead levels higher than 60, or um, blood lead levels in children. I want to um, acknowledge the external reviewers, Drs. Leggett, Freunds, Kosnett, Haddis, and Ginsburg, who provide extensive comments and guided this work. And finally, I want to acknowledge the co-authors and internal reviewers of the OEHA report. And a link to this report is listed at the bottom. Thank you very much. Thank you.